Welcome to the Korea Society's live webcast. I'm J.O., Senior Director of Arts and Culture. Television dramas, as we used to consume in the United States, have been transformed in the last two decades, away from television networks mainly, uh, mainly produced in the form of sitcoms and procedurals towards serial narrative with clear storylines developed across episodes. At the same time, the notion of quote unquote quality television has changed the way we evaluate TV content from intentionally mindless entertainment to innovative cultural works. Dr. Michelle Cho argues that these shifts have been fortuitous for the rise in popularity of Korean television shows in the US. Michelle will introduce you to the characteristics of Korean television serials known as K-dramas that account for their intense bingeability, that's a word, and contextualize the place of Korean television content in our increasingly global media landscape. Michelle Cho is a assistant professor at the Department of East Asian Studies at the University of Toronto. She has published many articles on Korean cinema and television, pop music and music videos, and she's currently at work on a book about gender, media, and fandom in Korean wave popular culture. Welcome to the Korea Society, Michelle. Thank you so much for joining us. We were supposed to have this program with you back in April, which had to be postponed. So I am so glad that you're finally here. A quick reminder to our viewers, you can send your questions via Twitter at Korea Society Art or email artsandculture at koreasociety.org. And Michelle, the screen is yours. Great, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I'm so happy that we were able to organize this Zoom version of this presentation, even though the original um, date happened really right around the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but in fact, I think that, um, you know, in some ways the timing is fortuitous because um, I'm going to be spending a little bit of time talking about a series that actually did very, very well as a kind of pandemic binge. So um, that sort of happens later on in my presentation, um, but I have some background on TV, the kind of changes that have happened within um, the television landscape, both in the US and the um, entry of Korean TV drama content into the US market to give you before I get there. Um, so I am going to um, share my screen with you. I have a PowerPoint presentation um, that I will go through. And then I really look forward to uh, Q&A and conversation after this. OK. Um, so, yeah, the title of the talk is K-Drama Fever, or Global TV in the U.S. Um, and like I said, I'm going to focus a little bit on the special kind of case of Crash Landing on You, which is a TV drama that was very popular earlier in 2020. Um, but before I get there, I want to kind of go through some of this historical context that I think is really important in order for us to be able to understand what Korean TV um, offers to American um, or North American viewers today, um, how it kind of enters into our televisual landscape, um, and then how it might actually impact us as viewers um, to think more about the way that the world uh, is, is organized as a, a space and a place that we are implicated in and how we relate to those in other parts of it. Okay, so I'm starting off at a very, very basic level. What is TV? A lot of the time, um, we just sort of assume that we know what TV is. We've had plenty of experience with it in our everyday lives. Um, but at the same time, TV has changed so very much in a fairly short period of time. Um, and so TV now is not so connected to that you know, cathode ray tube um, technology that you see in this image here, which is a photograph from the 1950s. Um, so what does it mean that TV has kind of broken out of the box? And um, 
what has changed about TV, but what has stayed the same about it. This is something that I want to discuss here. So again, at the very basic level, television is a compound word. <laughs> um, tele means at or across a distance. So it's the same prefix that's used in words like uh, telegraph, um, telecommunications, right? And then vision is seeing or viewing across that distance. Um, so broadcast television, um, is a technology that allows us as viewers to tap into an image or a spectacle along with many, many others that's being sent from one source to many. And so the way that television as a broadcast technology has been understood is that it creates community by giving the viewer a clear understanding of the way that they are part of a mass audience, that you are watching something live, um, especially in the kind of beginnings of television technology, um, that you're watching something live alongside many other people. And um, historically, television audiences have been very much defined in terms of national audiences. Um, you know, the television definitely travels across borders, so you can be part of a regional audience as well. Um, but generally speaking, television was a tool that created a sense of commonality um, within kind of national boundaries or in national units, national groups. Um, this national framing is definitely true of the Korean context. So broadcast media, um, it begins in on the Korean Peninsula actually in the early parts of the 20th century. Um, radio and TV here are very, very connected. Um, industrially, all of the major TV networks that we know of today actually started off as radio stations and continue to operate as radio stations as well. So this idea of broadcasting from the one to many in a live form um, that carries over between the kind of auditory medium of radio to the televisual medium of TV. Um, so radio, again, it starts off in uh, 1927 in, in Korea on the Unified Peninsula. So this is before the division of North and South Korea. Um, it starts off as Kyungsung Broadcasting Corporation, which then goes through a few different um, kind of changes in management to become KBS, the Korean Broadcasting System, which we know of today. Um, television is introduced in the 1950s, but very few people actually have access to the hardware that you need in order to watch TV. So TV uh, sets <laughs> are kind of hard to come by, um, mostly because they're not so affordable for the population when, when television broadcast first begins. But by the late 1970s, TV has become a really dominant broadcast form. And that's again, because most people can have a TV set in their house. Um, in the case of the US, um, there's a similar kind of history of relationship between radio and television and a kind of movement between um, radio as the primary operating uh, mode of broadcast companies and then a movement into TV. Um, so terrestrial TV or the type of TV that uses radio signals, um, it begins in the 40s in the US. Um, I, I kind of spelled out the acronyms for these very familiar uh, networks, NBC, CBS, and ABC, because I wanted you to actually see the way that they, again, refer to a national audience. So NBC stands for National Broadcasting Company. ABC is American Broadcasting Company. In the case of CBS, Columbia Broadcasting System, uh, CBS was a uh, broadcasting company that was under the parent company of the Columbia um, Phonograph Company, <laughs> which later becomes Columbia Records. So that also kind of shows you the direct genealogy between audio, sound, broadcasting, and television. Um, so as in the case of South Korea um, or Korea in general, um, 
television is introduced and then it takes a few years for a lot of people, the public at large, to acquire the hardware that's needed to actually consume it. So it becomes quite popular in the United States by the mid 1950s. Cable TV is an important transition point. Um, this is a different mode of delivering TV content, TV signals through coaxial cables, as opposed to radio uh, signal kind of transmissions. So cable TV is introduced in the late, um, it's actually introduced also in the like 50s, but it doesn't become kind of popular. Most people don't have access to cable TV until really around the late 80s and 90s. So I wanna introduce you to this idea of global television and how um, from the beginning, even though TV has a very national framing, it's still also considered to be a technology that connects people in various parts of the world to a similar kind of vision of life, vision of uh, entertainment and ways of thinking of themselves as a kind of transnational community. So television technology was introduced in East Asia by Americans, um, first in Japan and then in South Korea. And this happens after World War II, um, after the Korean War. Because we're talking about the Cold War here, um, television is part of a repertoire of technologies for communication in a military context. And it's also a way to kind of spread the image of American life and the American dream to territories that are under American influence in the Asia Pacific. So television is um, giving people access to um, a new post-war consumer society that they start to kind of aspire to. Um, and this consumer society basically consists of nuclear families who are kind of all gathered around their own television sets in their own homes um, and connected together through a network of television signals. Um, there are some important developments in television technology in South Korea, um, technology and uh, industry. So um, by the 1970s and 80s, a lot of families have been able to acquire television sets and TV is a very dominant um, broadcast medium. Um, part of what kind of spurs people to want to acquire TVs is um, the fact that there's a variety now of programming that um, that people want to watch together, again, to connect them into this national community and to make them feel like they are part of this um, new kind of modern society that is being developed during this period of time. Um, so you see the division of the TV industry beyond KBS into two major networks, NBC and KBS. Um, color television is introduced to the Korean market at this time. Um, and television is very integrated with other pop culture forms, especially popular music. So there's a lot of um, music performance shows, variety shows, um, popular entertainment shows that provide diversion for the public, um, but again, also connect them into this national audience. Now, to switch gears a little bit and talk about te te Korean television in the US, because I was just talking about Korean TV in Korea, um, there's another kind of important history of um, how it enters into um, the US media markets and how um, it finds audiences and then expands that audiences partly through a kind of change in technologies. So that's what I'm gonna talk about now. Um, so Korean TV has actually um, been watchable, or you could you could access Korean TV in um, the United States since the mid 1970s, um, and we're talking here about Korean TV that is produced in Korea and then kind of distributed in the U.S. Um, I'm not talking here about uh, Korean American television um, or 
television content that is being produced by Asian American audiences or Asian Americans um, in the US. That's a, a very interesting topic as well. Maybe we could um, chat about it a bit in the Q&A. Um, but for now, I am um, talking here about the import of Korean TV content for viewers who reside in the United States. Um, so initially, there was a kind of two channel system for Korean immigrants um, or Korean speakers in the US to access Korean TV content. Um, I'm drawing here on the research of Sung Jin Lee, who is a film and media scholar um, based currently in Singapore. Um, and he's done really important historical work on um, this kind of development of television uh, viewing, practicing, viewing practices among Korean Americans. Um, so a um, Korean language TV station starts in 1975 in Los Angeles, and then um, KBS is actually able to broadcast some of its content on public access channels or on cable television, especially in, you know, areas where there are significant uh, Korean Korean populations. So um, alongside these actual TV channels that are broadcasting Korean TV, there's also a an extensive video rental market. So there are video stores in large metro areas. Um, Sung Jin Lee mentions LA, New York, San Francisco, DC, Atlanta. I can add Chicago. That's where I grew up. And I remember, you know, going with my parents to the Korean grocery store and they had like a video store in the back. And so my parents would rent, you know, piles of VHS tapes um, so that they could watch um, Korean dramas, K-dramas basically um, at home. So this was the way that, you know, Korean TV was consumed by, again, this diasporic audience in the US of Korean speakers. Um, you know, generally speaking, these TV stations and the video rentals were not subtitled. So they really were not able to be distributed to people who didn't have access to the Korean language or couldn't understand what was happening in them. Um, this starts to change around um, the mid 2000s, I would say, where um, Korean dramas in particular start to be exported into TV markets around Asia and then also be distributed via um, kind of pirated file sharing, um, online through um, networks so that people can start to watch this content who are outside of the Asian region and who also don't necessarily speak Korean because these shows start to become uh, subtitled by fans often. So Hallyu here refers to the Korean wave. Um, that's a kind of English translation of the word Hallyu. So television shows are really the, the core of the first wave of Korean culture, Korean popular culture to leave Korea's borders and travel out into the world. Um, nowadays, we really think of K-pop as the primary engine of the Korean wave, but television is certainly a very, very important part of it. Um, so again, this starts happening in the latter part of the first decade of the 2000s. Um, <clears throat> and this is also when our TV viewing habits in North America start to shift pretty significantly away from, you know, um, sitcoms or shows that are episodic where you're not necessarily following a uh, storyline that continues from the first um, episode of a series through the end um, to series that really are much, much more um, kind of continuous. You, you have to kind of catch up on a show in order to really understand what's happening, which is really not the case when you're watching a sitcom because each episode is meant to kind of stand alone as a, uh, a separate entity. So you can enjoy it um, without feeling like you're, you're losing out in any way on understanding what's going on. Um, so 
there's really this kind of historical coincidence, this is my argument, um, between the way that television is changing in the North American context to feature more of these kind of um, continuous storyline serial shows um, and the way that Korean television has always operated, which is to have these, you know, discrete stories with the beginning and the end um, that happen over multiple episodes. Um, so in a way, Korean TV serials, they, um, they come into the US market through technologies like streaming, like file sharing at a moment when North American TV is also changing and moving closer to the Korean norm. So um, what really helps Korean television attract audiences outside of the Korean diaspora, so outside of Korean speakers or people who are already familiar with Korean culture and society is again through the transformation of the technological landscape of TV. So I have a couple of um, acronyms here <laughs> on my slide in the second point. Um, OTT refers to over the top services. So this is a term that refers to um, content delivery that happens usually online or on devices other than your TV. Um, and this is a, uh, a term and a business practice that catches on, again, from the probably the latter part of the 2000s onwards as a way for people to untether themselves from particular TV networks or particular devices. Um, VOD is video on demand. So, um, you know, over the top delivery and VOD, um, they're not really the same thing because VOD is definitely something that begins with um, kind of on demand television that you're still accessing through your TV set, um, through, you know, cable or through DVR, um, or sorry, digital <laughs> television or satellite TV. But nevertheless, there's a way that you're, you're able to access the content that you want when you want it, as opposed to being connected to the TV broadcasting schedule where you just tune into whatever is being broadcast at the time. And you are kind of beholden to the broadcaster schedule. You know, there's a reason why um, I think subscriptions for TV Digest or TV Guide <laughs> um, are, are down or maybe that um, publication no longer exists because most of us do not need that kind of guide in order to watch TV because we watch TV when we want, usually on our laptops or on other kind of devices that we use to access the internet. So um, this transformation of TV from, um, again, being this continuous stream of broadcast content that the viewer doesn't have a lot of uh, control over to um, TV being um, the kind of content that you can watch in a variety of ways on your mobile device, on your computer, um, on your television, but using a kind of casting device. You know, all of that is um, discussed within TV scholarship as cutting the cord um, or moving TV beyond the box. So outside again of this, um, model of television that we understand coming from its beginnings as a terrestrial broadcasting technology. So in the case of Korean TV, um, at first it's being disseminated through a bunch of sites that are sort of in this gray area, they're not really legal because um, the content is not licensed from the um, TV networks in Korea that are producing it. So some of these websites might ring a bell if there are um, K-drama fans in the audience who have been watching Korean television for a while. Um, but there were uh, websites like mysoju.com. Um, that was one that I used quite a lot. Um, there is, um, you know, Korean, uh, Korean drama. There were just many that you could kind of find this content on um, sometimes with fan subs um, that enabled you to kind of 
access this content, um, but you had to really go out and search for it. And again, it was kind of quasi-legal, not very clear. Um, around 2008, that really changes because you have the first, uh, you have the establishment of the first um, few site websites that actually work with Korean TV producers, um, Korean networks in Korea to license the content so that it can be offered in an above board way <laughs> on the internet for North American audiences. So um, Vicky.com is a, a site still exists today that I'm going to say a little bit more about in a minute. Um, but there's Drama Fever. Um, that's another site that was actually um, started by two diaspora Koreans um, in the US who um, then, you know, directly partnered with networks in South Korea in order to put a lot of their content onto this subscription site, Drama Fever. It unfortunately ends <laughs> in 2018, and we can talk more about the details of Drama Fever's demise um, during the Q&A if you'd like, but in any case, it's sadly it's defunct. Um, but Vicky continues, Crunchyroll is actually um, a streaming site that features a lot of anime content and it also starts to show Korean dramas um, and it has a similar kind of inception story as Drama Fever and Vicky. All three of these sites are the brain children of um, you know young uh, immigrants in the U.S. who kind of decide to start up these um, streaming companies um, and then they grow because the audience grows. Um, it's a little bit later that Hulu and Netflix get in on the picture. Actually, Drama Fever starts to partner with Hulu um, as well. And so that's really how Hulu starts to feature Korean drama content. It's through that partnership with Drama Fever. Um, and Netflix, I'll be saying a lot more about in just a second. So Okay, now we've established the kind of backstory of how Korean TV content finds a foothold in the US, how it was uh, distributed initially through mostly Korean immigrant communities and then becomes part of a broader media landscape as Americans um, are changing the ways that they access TV content, moving outside the box, and also the ways that the internet is really allowing people to move across borders of culture, nation, and language in order to access content that they're interested in. You know, it's a really, really different TV landscape um, than we're talking about even in the 1990s um, before the internet plays such a strong role. Um, so as I was saying earlier, I believe that um, Korean TV becomes available on streaming sites that are accessed by many people um, who can have kind of at their fingertips a whole array of international content that they might not have been accustomed to before. Um, at a moment when US TV trends are also shifting again to the, these longer form narratives that happen over the course of an entire season. Um, and that really, um, require a bit more attention or focus on the part of the viewer. So there's some discussion about why it's the case that um, television shows tended to be, you know, again, episodic with the exception of soap operas. Those were always a kind of ongoing storyline um, and they didn't make any sense if you just tuned into one episode very sporadically, um, but otherwise other TV during prime time tended to be easy to watch in a slightly distracted state. Um, it's again in the in the first decade of the 2000s, um, you know, after roughly 2006, that there's this kind of turn pretty um, pretty distinct, a lot of it through kind of HBO shows or cable shows towards what we now refer to as quality television. So TV that is taking on complex themes really, again, requires that you focus and that you follow a storyline. Um, you know, this is also a time when um, shows start to really seek after um, 
smaller audiences, but audiences that will be more devoted. So because of the fragmentation of the TV audience, starting from the national scale to um, more niche kind of demographics, after cable diversifies what's on TV to the TV outside the box where um, TV shows are really targeting a much smaller audiences, um, there's a real emphasis on creating opportunities for fan engagement, fan participation. Um, this happens in a variety of ways. One of the kind of um, most, um, like a, a kind of watershed moment in this transformation of how television shows imagine their audiences is really with the show Lost, because um, that's a show that had such a cult following and fans would talk to each other online in chat rooms and really try to come up with ideas that then the show's writers and producers were paying attention to. And so there was a sense of an exchange between fans, viewers, and the TV um, producers that, you know, continues with some of the most kind of culty or um, the shows that have the, the strongest cult followings. Now, um, and this kind of viewer um, show uh, producer interaction is as also a staple of Korean dramas. Um, there's long been a kind of connection between audience responses and the ways that TV writers in the Korean context write their scripts because they also want to encourage fan engagement or fan investment in the shows by, um, by being responsive by by showing the viewers that they are actually paying attention to what viewers want. So this has kind of become a familiar trope of some Korean dramas that, you know, sometimes fan uh, theories or fan um, biases can really shift the narrative of a show <laughs> and create strange outcomes. But again, this is in order to really show that there's a two-way conversation going on because that definitely encourages fan participation. Um, so Korean dramas um, start to become integrated from these kind of standalone uh, streaming platforms like drama fever um, to um, to sites that also uh, stream other content from elsewhere in the world like Netflix and Hulu. Um, I'm going to talk about Netflix in a little bit, um, but uh, I just want to kind of point out here that there's a way that Korean television content keeps moving sort of outside of the, the exclusive purview of, you know, Korean diasporic audiences to audiences that enjoy, you know, East Asian popular culture to audiences that are just interested in global TV to audiences who are just, you know, kind of looking for something to watch and happen upon Korean dramas when they're surfing um, these streaming sites for other things, new, new content to consume. Um, I did want to mention very quickly also the the way that um, as Korean television moves outside of this diaspora audience, it starts to gain also um, fans. It builds a kind of fan culture around itself so that um, viewers of K-dramas are starting to meet each other online in chat forums to find each other um, and connect with each other the way that a subculture kind of forms. So I'm just gonna show you um, a blast from the past. Um, this is a screenshot of dramabeans.com, which is um, a really interesting website um, that is part of almost every Korean drama addict I know, part of their story. So part of the way that they um, started to watch Korean dramas and really become um, involved in Korean dramas or integrate Korean dramas into their daily lives. Um, but Drama Beans um, was an early site that uh, provided K-drama recaps. So this is, you know, kind of, um, verbal summaries of um, 
Korean drama episodes and also invited a lot of um, discussion, conversation, and chats about Korean dramas where K-drama lovers could kind of meet each other, even if um, you know they were not in the same locality, they could kind of meet each other and connect over their love of Korean TV on this website. Um, Okay, so just to say a quick thing about Vicky.com, um, Vicky again still exists. It's quite successful. Um, it started off in 2007, um, interestingly, as a language learning tool because it offered its users the ability to try and learn various languages by um, fan subbing or writing subtitles for. Um, various types of television content. Um, and some people kind of still use it for that in, in that way that they um, see it as a really important language learning tool. Um, and there's a sense in which um, I think it is the case that watching television in a different language can really help you to work on your language skills and also your listening comprehension in particular. Um, but so by 2013, it kind of shifts into a subscription site where, um, and this is kind of amazing. I think that sometimes people who are not fans of Korean drama cannot believe that this is a possible business model, but um, Vicky.com continues to be um, a subscription site where you pay for the service, but still uses volunteer labor to subtitle their content. So fans, still kind of pay to be able to volunteer their time, to spend their time um, subtitling shows for the benefit of other fans. Um, so Vicky.com is acquired by a Japanese media company, Rakuten in 2013, um, and it kind of expands its range. And at this point, um, I think it has a substantial number of users. Um, so it still uses the model of fan subbing, but it is licensing content. So it is kind of legal um, in the way that um, obviously Hulu and Netflix is. So it's kind of combining these two forms of a kind of subcultural framework of using fan labor um, and kind of creating this economy where fans kind of gift each other um, subtitles and their time and attention. Um, but then they're also picking up on the um, standard practices of streaming sites. Um, so it's this hybrid form. Okay, so um, I'm gonna say a few things about Netflix um, and kind of talk about how Netflix becomes in the US a repository for what I'm calling global TV. Um, in a way, Netflix is a really interesting um, case because it kind of decides um, not long after it shifts its uh, business model from being a DVD rental kind of subscription service to a streaming site to then try to move beyond the US market and sign up subscribers around the world. It has been quite successful in doing that, um, but it was a bit slow going. Um, it expanded into Canada in 2010 and it took them um, about a year to sign up a million subscribers in Canada. Um, and some markets are still quite um, difficult for Netflix to penetrate because all of their content has to be separately licensed and um, kind of approved given the regulatory frameworks that are different in every single country. Um, but it persisted in this kind of globalization effort. And by 2015, it's expanded to 50 countries. By 2018, it's 190 countries. Um, and today there are about 183 million subscribers worldwide. Um, you can still see though that the largest proportion of streaming subscribers are in the US and Canada. Canada has about 7 million of those streaming uh, of those subscribers. So the US is still 60 million, it's the largest. And if you look on the right side of this graph, um, the Asia Pacific is the smallest kind of region in terms of paying subscribers. So that gives you a sense of who um, Netflix is marketing its uh, it's a um, variety of Asian TV shows. 
to, and Korean TV shows too. It's obviously not audiences in Asia, it's audiences elsewhere, many of whom are in North America. Um, so the US is the largest, has the largest content library in Netflix's kind of global repertoire. Um, it has about 5,000 titles. Um, what's interesting is that um, Netflix starts to offer content in other languages um, beyond its film library. So it offers television shows in Korean um, fairly early. So after um, it's kind of switched to um, being a exclusively a streaming platform, um, it does offer non-US TV series, but at first it's only um, from three different industries. So the UK, um, Latin America and Korea. So that gives you a little bit of a sense um, of how um, major a uh, player in global TV, the Korean industry has become um, by the early 2010s. Um, and that's because Korean television shows, Korean producers of shows are really thinking about export and about finding audiences outside of the country. So I'm kind of winding up, but I want to make sure that I talk about um, the case of Crash Landing on You, which is a show that some of you may be familiar with. It was quite um, a popular television show from the early part of 2020. Um, it was interestingly broadcast both um, on cable television in South Korea on TVN and it was released on Netflix almost simultaneously. I mean, the Netflix um, Netflix started streaming it once all of the episodes were available. Um, so this screenshot just kind of again illustrates that these shows are integrated into the platform so that you access them um, not in this kind of separate um, space where you already have to be a fan of Asian content in order to find it. It's sort of suggested to you among an array of other content. Um, so just to tell you a little bit more about Crash Landing, um, it's the second most popular series on the cable network TVN um, to date. So um, the show that actually broadcast after it became, <laughs> um, got even higher ratings numbers, um, but viewership numbers in at around 22% are very, very high. Um, given the, um, the way that the TV market again has changed over time with the entry of cable and streaming, it's pretty tough for shows to reach um, audience viewership kind of proportions of over even 5%, so the 22% is quite high. Um, Netflix released um, a story that claimed that Crash Landing on You was one of the most streamed shows during the early months of the pandemic. So it was reportedly the third most streamed TV show in March, 2020. Um, and that again is across its entire kind of global um, empire, I guess, <laughs> of, of streaming uh, across the world. Um, and we have to just trust Netflix because they're the only ones that can collect the precise audience numbers for any of the content that they host on their platform. But nonetheless, um, Netflix or this, this show was extremely popular, um, again, outside of South Korea on this global TV platform. Um, the plot elements of this show are really interesting because they're um, a fusion of very conventional, um, tropes of Korean dramas, many of which are sort of centered on rom-com elements or romance elements. So Crash Landing is definitely a, a romance story, um, but it is actually set in um, the context of North Korea, South Korea relations. So it also brings in this kind of geopolitical dimension. And it also draws on a kind of history of um, 
the separation between families, between um, individuals that have not been able to see each other because of the division of the peninsula. So um, it has this kind of typical star-crossed lovers element, um, but then it's also a kind of fantastic wish fulfillment <laughs> kind of show. Um, so it involves two characters, uh, a romantic couple at its center, um, the South Korean woman, is a businesswoman. She has a paragliding accident, which is kind of um, ridiculous. Uh, it's styled slightly uh, similarly to um, Dorothy's um, Dorothy's run-in with a tornado in The Wizard of Oz. Um, and so then she finds herself um, accidentally in the DMZ. Uh, her love interest is an elite military officer um, who finds her and rather than turning her over to the North Korean authorities, he actually tries to help her return home safely. And of course they fall in love. So it's a 16 episode series. Um, and the first nine episodes are set in North Korea. So that's very, very interesting because um, it's sort of the first of its kind to really take pains to create a North Korean setting that is realistic, that um, is a place that a lot of the romantic action is set. Um, so it almost humanizes North Korea by structuring its story in this way because North Korea suddenly becomes a place where people can meet and fall in love and you know have neighborly spats and this kind of thing. So this really is unprecedented in um, the kind of history of representations of North Korea in South Korean media. So it's a fusion of fantasy and reality. Um, it is based on a couple of um, incidents that were reported in the media from earlier um, in 2008 and 2005, um, kind of breezing through this because I know we're short on time. Um, but also in terms of its production development, it involved extensive consultation with North Korean defectors. And so that's how they were able to um, create this North Korean setting that um, was again, so, so different from the way that North Korea has been depicted in other media texts, other films and other TV shows. Um, it cast, you know, these very A-list recognizable actors um, from Korea who have already established their popularity within the Asian region. Um, so it had massive viewership across East and Southeast Asia um, and also had a high level engagement um, as seen from uh, Twitter uh, commentary and discussions from viewers in North America and the Philippines who were talking to each other in English. Um, this is the, the kind of central couple here. Um, and so what, um, what the case of Crash Landing on You kind of tells us is that um, viewers were really interested in the romance, um, but they also through that process and through the kind of connections that they created by watching this um, K-drama, which has you know all these romance and melodrama elements, um, but a narrative that really drives forward and keeps you engaged, so that you know at, at the end of each episode you want to watch the next one, <laughs> um, and that's really a hallmark of Korean dramas. They they really connected in a strongly emotional way with the characters, and so. Um, um, there's a sense that, you know, Korean drama, it serves as obviously an entertainment vehicle. It makes you kind of think a lot about the characters and the context that you're watching, but it also kind of brings you into a world that is built by the show through co-feeling. So this is in um, scholars who have written about um, trans cultural reception of Korean shows talk about this as affective consumption. There are strong emotional affinities with the characters um, and you start to kind of see things from a different perspective because you are identifying with the character so strongly. Um, so while you have this kind of emotional connection, there's also um, a really important element of localization that individual viewers will see things in slightly different ways based on who they are and where they're located. So this is not to say that global TV is just quote unquote universal. It does 
communicate in different ways in different places, depending on, you know, what the viewer is going through and what their cultural context is. Um, but nevertheless, it always prompts individual viewers to kind of think about commonalities, things that um, they have in common with the characters that they're watching and the way that, um, you know, that there's a lot that kind of divides us, but at the same time, this um, this space of you know co-feeling really connects us all to each other. Um, so I think that in closing, so to sum up, um, the the impact of Korean dramas and their popularity in in North America is really telling us a lot about the world today and how we're really motivated to try to connect to each other through the media that we consume and the ways that we can kind of put ourselves into other people's shoes um, through this process. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was just fascinating to hear your um, talk on this fascinating subject and I have so many questions coming in so I'm going to try to cover as many of them as possible but one of the biggest questions as you mentioned um, you know a lot of our viewers who are in North America obviously a lot of them probably um, get to K-dramas through Netflix or Hulu whatever is usually available and you just mentioned that how Netflix's real focus is on the North American, not necessarily the diaspora or the Asian community, but for you know the general public, whoever they may be. So everybody's sort of wondering, do what does K drama tells these people about the Korea society? And you mentioned that just in Crash Landing on You, you know there are certain tropes that we see in Korean dramas. Um, a lot of the times there's a really rich person who has a very extravagant lifestyle. Um, a lot of them is sort of the born um, very poor, but trying to climb up the you know, um, ladder, sort of the societal ladder. Um, you know, what I normally uh, refer to as the candy candy syndrome, sort of that, you know, the you know, poor girl versus rich boy, that kind of tropes that exist. So what do you think in the, the, the Korea society, the South Korea, obviously, that is depicted in K-drama. What do you think that is for the uh, non-Korean audience? Mm. I mean, I think that um, what you see oftentimes in Korean dramas are stories that involve characters that are envisioning some sort of change to their lives. Uh, kind of desire for social mobility or a way of self-actualizing themselves or, you know, uh, kind of maturing or growing or, you know, these are all very typical kind of um, plot elements of these shows. And I think that um, you can see very, very similar um, plot elements and tropes from throughout um, Korean film uh, from the post-war period onwards, um, even before that. So um, I think that um, there, there's a lot of interest in how to talk about a modernizing society or a society in transition or the kind of instabilities that um, mark contemporary life, you know, all of these um, elements, I mean, so the Cinderella story is a version of a rags to riches story that was also extremely common in, you know, Hollywood classical cinemas um, of the early 20th century. You know, there's nothing kind of new about this, but then it gets translated into the contemporary context um, or in different cultural contexts. And I think that's why people relate to these stories so much. Um, and so what does it say about Korea specifically? Well, that it is plugged into a kind of global um, mode of storytelling, I would say. Um, and that, you know, the reason why these um, shows are so popular around the world is because, you know, a lot of people feel that in their own context, they also are dealing with similar challenges or social currents. And as this global popularity of K-dramas seems to be ever increasing, 
Do you think that this is another viewer's question? Do you think this will change sort of these tropes that are in K drama? Do you think um, when the Korean TV producers are now writing and making these dramas, you mentioned that you know now there are considerations. They want to cast somebody who already is pretty popular in, for example, Southeast Asian market. Um, but do you think that will change the narratives or the characters or will it be much more quote unquote global or would it, would it be much more Korea focused or Korea, Korea specific? Mm -hmm. That's a really great question because um, I think it, it um, kind of allows us to focus on what I think is very, very particular about Korean television, which is that Korean TV producers are always in kind of a double bind because they can't totally disregard the local audience or the domestic audience. They have to create something that they think will be appealing both abroad and at home. That also goes for film <laughs> as well and pop music. <laughs> so um, in a way, you know, there have been certain genres of TV show that tend to really focus way, way more on the um, international audience than the the local one, but they happen to be, you know, like youth oriented shows or shows that, you know, already are not really aiming for a cultural mainstream in South Korea anyways that are already niche, but otherwise shows that are going to be, you know, like phenomenal hits um, that are really going to reach across many demographics. They need to be able to do that both in Korea and overseas. And so I think that that, that means that, um, yeah, like a show like Crash Landing on You, again, it's so specific to the South Korean context, right? And, or mm -hmm. the Korean peninsular context, but really it's targeting viewers in South Korea. And so it was in a, it's, it was a huge hit domestically, but somehow it also managed to be a huge global hit. I mean, it had viewers from all over the world and um, people were very, very into the story from across the entire Asian region, as well as in North America. So how, so, so would you define Crash Landing on You as more global than local? I don't think you can actually make a determination. It's like both at the same time. And so I think that's what the most um, that's what most Korean TV producers are aiming for, to be, th for the most global hits to be also the most local. Well, I guess sometimes when you're most specific, then that becomes universal. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I think there were some questions about, it, it, you just mentioned all this, the fan base um, and how some Korean dramas what I think a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of the Korean dramas, the production goes on while it's on. It's not like every, the whole season is done or the whole series is done before they start broadcasting. So that sort of um, fan engagement happens very naturally because while they are showing the television program on television, they're actually making it too. So it almost becomes simultaneous kind of um, relationship. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do wonder if that's really good for the storyline because it seems like the Korean dramas inevitably <laughs> there's a happy ending because nobody wants to see there because as you said the, you get so involved in these characters and and so and I've heard the stories of the fans asking not to make it into a sad ending because they don't want their favorite character to suffer or to die or you know not get the girl or the boy um what do you think of that sort of aspect of that fan engagement yeah i mean you know what's interesting is that um the kind of first wave of korean shows that became very um successful as exports they were first um you know kind of sold to and broadcast on television in Japan, um, other parts of East Asia, and they tended to be these sad, sad romances, like Winter Sonata is a great example, right? And so this is an example of the way that cultural tastes really change over time, because I don't think that you see the same sort of, you know, lovers 
um, who one of them has a terminal illness and then they die. And, you know, that's like the beautiful love story. Um, but yeah, to get to the kind of point about this live, live shooting, live broadcast practice, which is still standard practice in Korean television industries. Um, there are some exceptions where a show will be pre-scripted and pre-shot completely and then broadcast, but that's really, really kind of like high, high level, um, very, uh, very few shows have that kind of prestige to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of people have complained about how that live shooting process, A, ruins the narrative <laughs> um, because it becomes incoherent and B, that it's very, very bad labor practice. Hmm. So yeah, there, there, there are pros and cons. There are arguments on both sides. The practice still persists, obviously, for a reason, because it still works and, and viewers prefer it to have a say. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are also good reasons to try and think of changing it. But also, as one of our viewers pointed out, what's interesting is that a lot of these uh, writers are female, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the directors are male mostly I think mm -hmm. but at least the writers any of the you know sort of the recent ones that were very popular they were actually written by females and uh, sort of the, and there's that sort of tradition of female tv writers and they seems to be some of them seems to be doing some really interesting work mm -hmm. um, so if you can just quickly talk about that <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think it's really fascinating that television has been in South Korea a space where women can really find success and recognition. Whereas, you know, in film, they've been so uh, rare um, as directors. Um, the, the, the hierarchy, the kind of gender split is very, very kind of uh, it's, it's, it's not very equitable. <laughs> um, but in terms of writing for television, I think that it's been so interesting to see these women writers who can really make a name for themselves and have some creative autonomy. Um, and in a way it's because the television shows are thought to be mostly um, kind of created for audiences that are female. I don't think that that's necessarily yeah. true. Yeah. But that's nevertheless the perception. So um, the the writers that I think are the most interesting right now are you know ones that are doing a lot of like genre bending, or doing um, really interesting things with um, historical narratives, but in a kind of fusiony way where they're bringing in um, using a kind of the skeleton of a historical figure, historical event, and then doing really fascinating things with it. So the the um, the series Kingdom, for instance, is super fascinating. Also a Netflix show. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think that um, hopefully what the TV space is helping show the um, broader Korean entertainment industries is that um, women writers and their creativity are incredibly valuable and hopefully it's opening up more spaces for women creatives to take a leadership role. And I think there are going to be, I hope there are going to be many more of them to come. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, unfortunately we're almost running out of time, but I do wanted to ask you, we, when we decide to do this program, we said we're not going to really talk about the dramas itself um, themselves. But I have to ask you, um, if you have a favorite key drama that you want everybody to watch, what would that be? Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I almost I have so many. Um, but OK, just thinking about a show that I still kind of think about at times, um, a show called Nising. Right. So it's actually not a romance. It's a workplace drama. Um, that's, I, I don't know, it's, it's like a kind of strong criticism of Korean work culture. Um, but it also creates, I don't know, just like these very strong emotions. And um, it's just really good. 
people should should watch it. <laughs> and it's on Netflix. Actually. Yes. <laughs> I feel like we should have been supported by Netflix today because we've <laughs> talked about so many Netflix shows, but yes. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who'll be looking for these shows and continue to watch them. So thank you so much, Michelle, for your wonderful um, talk today. And this is a subject that is so big and I, I seriously don't think that one hour is not enough and I really yeah. hope that one day you can come back and we can talk more about the wonderful world of K-drama so thank you so much and stay healthy and um, special thanks to Peter our IT director for making this live webcast a possibility and to our interns Gi and Hiju for getting all the questions and doing email and social media outreach and of course to our viewers um, to our members of the Korea Society. We hope you'll join us again next week. Check out what's coming up on our website, koreasociety.org, where you can sign up to receive our emails or join as a member. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you.